Um, and in, uh, also at the University of Arizona, we did another postdoc where we expanded into uh, evolution of developmental gene expression. Um, and in 2004, he started here at uh, Georgia Tech. And his research throughout his career has been rooted in uh, understanding the evolution of highly social insects. Uh, more recently, he's done a lot of research on the molecular evolution and epigenetic basis of specialized social phenotypes, has uh, supervised my PhD as well as uh, me in a postdoctoral capacity now. So um, today he's going to tell us about his research. Thank you very much, Brendan. Thank you all for coming this morning. And I will be telling you about the social biology of insects today and some of the research that we are doing on this subject. All right, so I'll start off by telling you that the evolution of early social behavior or sociality represented one of the major transition points in biological history. And this was an important transition because individual organisms that reproduced independently came together to form groups of organisms that had to reproduce together, that had to live together. So they gave up basically independent living for group living. And this is what made this a major uh, transition. Of the social animals, the social insects are probably the most successful. And they have the most advanced social behavior. And our research program here at Georgia Tech, uh, we study the causes and consequences of sociality. We're interested in social behavior and all its forms, everything from molecular biology to ecology to evolutionary biology and everything uh, in between. And so what I'm going to do today for this uh, morning talk is I'm first going to start off with a little bit uh, of basic biology about social insects and I'm going to give you a little introduction to our favorite social insect, the yellow jacket. A little to sort of put that into context. And I'm going to try to give you a bunch of little uh, tidbits about research that is going on in our group related to social insect biology and we'll go uh, as long as we can uh, and, and get through all of these if, we, if possible. Alright, so let's start off with social insects. What are social insects? Who are they? So by social insects I am talking primarily about ants, termites, social bees, and social wasps. There are other insects that are also so, so, sort of social and group living but these are the major players. Now when I say social insects are successful, they really are. 75% of all insect biomass consists of social insects, which is amazing because only about 2% of the species of insects are social. Ants and termites are also among the primary earth movers, um, and the biomass of social insects actually exceeds that in some ecosystems. And this is a, an old drawing, with some famous drawing showing an ant uh, whose biomass is four times that of a leopard in sort of tropical rainforest because that is about the right ratio of insect, social insect biomass to vertebrate biomass in that biome. So what are the characteristics of social insects? Well, first of all, they show extreme cooperative and helping behavior. They work together to complete tasks very efficiently. They also live together for multiple generations. There's an overlap of generations where uh, the offspring live together with their mothers for some time, or fathers. But most importantly, there is this reproductive division of labor. What does that mean? That means that some individuals reproduce and some do not. And that is a hugely important uh, evolutionary innovation and change, that some individuals would essentially be selected to not reproduce. That's a very sort of weird thing to happen, but it really is the defining feature of the advanced social insects. And I want to spend another minute on this, uh, this reproductive division of labor. What this means is that there are essentially this so-called caste system. Caste meaning different behavioral groups. So I'm going to go into this. Th this these social insects right here, this is our friendly uh, neighborhood fire ant, in case you're curious. This is a male. This is not life-size, by the way. This is a male. This is a queen. And these are uh, workers. So. In this uh, caste system, it's the queens and males that mate and reproduce and do most of the dispersing. So these are the reproductive individuals. Whereas these individuals, there's no soldier caste in, in fire ants, but the workers, uh, they're the ones who forage, who defend the colony, um, find food, etc. And so you can see there's a huge difference in the way these individuals look. There's a huge difference in what they do. And importantly, these individuals cannot reproduce under any circumstance. They are sterile. 
So the elaboration of the caste system is certainly one of the most interesting uh, things that has to do with social insects. I've just shown a few photos here of some very interesting worker castes throughout, found throughout different social groups. Um, starting here, this is a so-called nasut termi a termite. This is a termite. And it has this developed this very special cannon-like projection that it uses only to basically fire out a repellent or glue at attackers. So what this thing does, what this cast, the soldier cast in this species of termite does, is it wanders around the colony doing nothing for basically its whole life, unless there's a breach in the colony wall, and then these things come flooding to the wall, and they fire this goop out of their cannon. And you can see, for what it's worth, like many, many termite uh, workers, these ones are blind. Um, this is a so-called phragmatic uh, soldier. This, this uh, soldier or worker has developed a very strange sort of head shape whereby it uses its head, its flat head, its hardened head, to block the entrance of a nest. So in this case, if a nest uh, entrance is breached, these guys or gals will come to that area. They'll basically block and stop up the, the uh, breach, prevent any invaders from coming in. That's their primary function. They sort of go, ar go around looking like this for the whole life. This is a so-called honeypot ant. This is a, rep a replete cast. These individuals basically store food in their back end uh, for long periods of time. They're found in the desert. And you can actually eat these. I don't, I've never have, but apparently they're, they're okay. They're not, they're not as good as their name, but their, their basic uh, um, function in the colony is food storage. And finally, this is a, a termite soldier, again, showing this very uh, heavily modified head part. You can see what this one's business is. It's got these very two uh, large pinchers. Looks very different from the worker, and it's basically used for you know, attacking uh, or defending. All right, so that's a very brief introduction to social insects in general. Now for social insects in particular, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, our most important social insect here on campus, which is the yellow jacket. So this is for your own you know, education, uh, so you'll know a little bit more about what yellow jackets are, impress your friends or something like that. So yellow jackets, what are yellow jackets? Well, it turns out that these are actually social wasps. In case uh, you didn't know that, they are wasps in the genus Vespula, and they live in highly social colonies. You don't see that, because I'll, I'll show you, they're usually underground. There are two common species in Atlanta. Um, Vespula squamosa is actually, this is this one right here. It's the southern yellow jacket. It's not as common. It's about 10 to 20 percent in Atlanta, and it's got these distinctive racing stripes on its thorax, in case you see them flying around. And they are bigger and larger than the eastern yellow jacket, uh, Vespula maculifrons. Again, they're, they're pretty hard to tell apart when they're flying around. Uh, they're pretty easy to tell apart when they're sort of sitting still. This one a bit smaller, and its sting hurts a whole lot less, as I can uh, tell you. So what are the casts in yellow jackets? Well, much like uh, most social insects, we have reproductive casts, the queen and the male, and then we have the worker cast. Now, you don't see the queens very much, except for the very, very beginning of the year, when the queens are looking to found new colonies, and the very end of the year, when new queens are going around on mating flights. The rest of the time, they pretty much hang out inside their nest. The male here looks a lot like the queen. He's a little smaller, a little thinner, has longer antennae. Again, you don't see these ones out and about very much. What you do see most often is the workers. These are the ones that are coming out everywhere now. They're the ones that do all the foraging and all of the stinging of you when you step on their nest. Um, they are considerably smaller than the queen or male. And again, for what it's worth, this one is the eastern yellow jacket. It does not have those two yellow racing stripes on its back. So I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, biology of yellow jackets. And actually, this will be sort of relevant later. Yellow jackets and all ants, bees, and wasps have what is known as a haplodiploid method of sex determination, or haplodiploid genetic system. And that means that queens are diploid, they have two copies of their alleles, while males have only one copy. And this has a lot of weird uh, effects in terms of the social biology, certainly in terms of the colony and family structure. Um, just to show you sort of how reproduction happens here, when a queen and a male mate, the male, if he only has one allele to give or one chromosome, he necessarily gives that to his female offspring, the queen that is diploid, for in this case the red and the light blue 
alleles or chromosomes, can donate either one of these to her offspring. Now, when we, ha we have a fertilization event like this, that means you're producing a female, because the individuals that result are going to have one chromosome each. Males, however, are produced directly and parthenogenetically by the queen. Okay, so in this case, these males have been produced without being fertilized. The queen just basically produces an egg that does not get fertilized and those develop into males. And this has a very strange effect that it means that uh, males have no fathers. It's kind of weird. And it also does weird things for the relatedness among individuals within colonies. And I'll touch on that a bit later. So what I'd like to do now is go over a little bit about the life cycle of the yellow jackets and what we might expect to see here in Atlanta. Um, I am going to start here, okay, with this, this point here, which would be very early in the spring, probably in this neck of the woods around, well, maybe April or so. Um, queens come out of hibernation, mated queens come out of hibernation and look to found a new colony. And sometimes you can see them, sometimes you find them in your house. There are these large queens that are looking for a place to make a new nest. Usually around here, the two species that we have, Esquimosa and Maculifrons, they like to nest underground. They especially like the base of trees or bushes. And then the queen will basically find a little spot or a little hole and she'll establish a nest there. She will do uh, some foraging during that time and she will start to build a nest herself. After a few weeks, after she's laid eggs and she's produced the first group of workers, the workers will emerge Okay, and they will take over basically all of the tasks of foraging and building the colony. And this will continue to go on. More and more workers will be produced. Nests will get bigger and bigger uh, throughout the spring and into the summer. So right now, you know, we're right here in July, and this is when the colonies are becoming really, not, I wouldn't say visible because they're still underground, but I'm getting a lot of phone calls now from people who are finding their yellow jacket nests because there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of activity. The colonies are really starting to get to large size. And by the end of the summer, probably August, September, you may have a nest that has, you know, 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 individuals in extremely large size that has produced that many individuals, all from a single queen. At this point, well, just when the temperature starts to change in September or October, the yellow jackets transition over from producing workers to producing new queens and males. So much like an annual plant that sort of grows for a while, produces leaves, and then flowers, yellow jacket colonies grow for a while, sort of vegetatively, and then produce new queens and males, new seeds, if you will. And these individuals, a colony can produce hundreds of new queens and males. Um, in sort of October or November, we think, they go on mating flights, the new queens and males will mate, the queens that have mated will eventually find a place to hibernate in a, in a sort of a rotting log or in leaf litter, and then at the end of the year, come December, when it really turns cold again, the entire old colony dies. So all of the workers that were left there, the old queen, um, any unmated queens, all the males, they all die off. So that's sort of good news if you have a yellow jacket nest, if you wait long enough, that nest will die off, at least in these parts of the country. And what that means is the whole population of yellow jackets at that time of year during winter, you know, during January, February, is represented solely by the mated queens that are overwintering, and then the colony uh, life cycle starts again the next year. Good question. So the physical size of the nest, whoopsie daisy, did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> you went right into my uh, next, there we go. Physical size of the nest is, uh, you can't see here, but at, at the end size, it's something larger, larger than a basketball, if you, if you get something, but about this size, about the size of a rugby ball would not be atypical, with hundreds uh, of cells for sure, maybe thousands of cells. Um, basically, these nests uh, shown here, they look like hornet's nests. They're not quite as big as hornet's nests, but they're underground. So instead of these things being built up in trees, they're built on the, the yellow jackets build them underground. Now, not, not all Vespula do that. Some Vespula do, build, they, they build them in other places, but here in the southeast in Atlanta, both species that we have like to build them typically underground. Um, the nest is, uh, interestingly, it's constructed of chewed up wood. So sometimes you'll see yellow jacket workers sitting on fence posts or things like that, chewing away at fences. And what they're doing is they're scraping up bits of wood and they're gonna bring that back to their nest and they're basically gonna take that pulp and build this paper nest shown here in cartoon. And so actually that's the first evolutionary use of paper long before we did it. Uh, wasps were using paper to build their nests. And these nests, uh, combs, as you can see here, they look very much like honeybee nests in terms of having different cells, even though this is a separate sort of uh, uh, evolutionary instance of 
uh, cell use, and they use these cells to rear up their young, to rear up the, the developing larvae and pupae. They do not, uh, the yellow jackets, not social wasps, do not make honey. They don't make anything delicious. They don't store honey in their cells. Um, you know, honeybees are basically uh, vegetarian wasps. You can look at it that way. These are not them, and they, they don't, uh, they're mostly sort of uh, nasty and aggressive and don't store useful food for us, at least. And so here you see a reasonable sized nest that we pulled out some time ago. Again, it's, it's bigger, this is part of the nest, it's bigger than sort of the palm of, uh, you know, what you can hold in the, in the palm of your hand and fold told it would be about that size. All right, so, to, it's coming co close to the end of this sort of uh, second batch of stuff on yellow jackets. So, what do they do, how do they live their life besides sort of getting in the way of you when you're mowing your lawn? Um, well, yellow jackets, they consume significant numbers of arthropods. That's sort of their main food source, is other insects. They'll also eat carrion, they'll eat anything. At certain times of year, they're attracted to sweets. Usually later, when they're starting to produce reproductives, in sort of September is when you'll really start to notice them being huge pests at picnics. But they just, they'll eat just about anything. Um, here, you have a couple of yellow jackets that are sort of tending these, uh, these ins other insects that produce honeydew, so they'll take that. Um, they are, of course, uh, a nuisance in many parts of the world. Yellow jackets, the, the genus Vespula is actually found all throughout the northern hemisphere, and it's been introduced to several places that we'll talk about in a few minutes. And for example, it's been introduced into New Zealand. This sign here, it says wasps, next five kilometers, is a sign actually taken from New Zealand. And when they do road work in certain parts of that country, they put these signs up because when they're disturbing the ground, there can be so many angry wasps in the air that you basically don't want to get out of your car at all. And this is a picture of a friend of mine who doesn't know I use this picture. And he's been stung several times in the back there by, this, is, uh, this was in Australia. He says, I got it because he's smiling. I think that makes it a little bit nicer, right? So finally, the sort of business end that we all know about, maybe, um, the sting, what is the sting and why, <laughs> maybe? Um, the sting is actually a modified egg layer, modified ovipositor, okay? So this is a structure that was many, many years ago used to lay eggs and now has been co-opted to deliver other stuff, other nasty proteins and things that hurt a lot. Um, Vespula wasps, yellow jackets, unlike honeybees, they can and do sting multiple times. So you think, you know, a honeybee maybe, it stings you once and it's got barbed, uh, a barbed stinger and then that'll stay in you and that'll sort of be the one time that it gets to fire its defense mechanism. Yellow jackets can sting multiple times. Interestingly though, because the sting is an ovipositor, an egg-laying apparatus, a modified one, it turns out that only females can sting. Only female yellow jackets can sting, males cannot. And another interesting side effect of that is that it turns out that our mascot is female. So Buzz, I don't know how that makes you feel, but morphologically female. Um, so that's sort of the, the first part of my talk on introductory and social biology and yellow jackets. Anybody have any questions or anything they'd like? Burning questions about yellow jackets? There, is, there are what's known about it. Um, it. People know what's in it. There's various, I'm not going to tell you exactly, but papyridine compounds, I think. There are, they're they're anti-vertebrate. Uh, a lot of it, is, it seems to be anti-vertebrate. So when they kill insects, they usually just do it with their mouths, which is kind of interesting. There have been a lot of studies about the, co the components of it beyond that. Um, is there anything more specific? No, yeah, no, no. yeah. I, I know that some snakes mostly use proteins and small peptides as venoms, but I don't know. About I don't know. The, yeah, I don't know the specifics. I don't know how they would fall in with that. It seems to be small molecules. I think so. I think so, but I'm not 100 percent sure about specifics. Yeah. Because in ants, isn't it primary, primary formic acid? Or so some ants have formic acid uh, that they use to spray. Um, and that's where the, the family of uh, ants, Formicity, gets that name from, and formic acid related to that. Um, that is not the case here, so as far as I know, they don't use or have that. And I don't think all, not all ants necessarily use formic acid, but there are some that, that do use that as a defensive compound, yeah. Yes? In the reproduction, does it mean that the males are, the males are genetically identical to one of the haploid genomes, or is that crossing over? There, yes, there is crossing over. So within the female, Okay, the female does produce a recombinant gambit, and that turns into the male. Yeah, yeah, good question. 
Other questions? Anything else? All right, so for the second part of this talk, what I'm going to do is basically just highlight some research that is going on in our group. Um, short, punchy, you know, five, ten minute talks. Here's what I'm aiming for, just to give you an idea of what we're doing and sort of the diversity of interests we have. And uh, what I'm going to do here, because I hardly do anything useful anymore, these are the people who actually do the work, uh, most of the work involved, to let you know and to give the acknowledgments where they should be. The folks in yellow here are folks who are graduate or undergraduate students who have been involved in the research in, this, in the particular uh, um, area that I'm talking about, and other folks are collaborators here or other places. So I'm going to start off by telling you about research that we're doing that we're interested in invasive social insects. And broadly speaking, we want to know why social insects are such successful and widespread invaders. So, first of all, I do have to tell you, you may or may not know this, that social insects are among the most successful and worst invasive species uh, that we know of. For example, in a recent uh, list that was put together by a, a, con a conservation group um, of the 100 worst invasive species, um, of the worst land invertebrates, Social insects made up many, the ones with the little lightning bolts by them. These are all invasive social insects. Other land invertebrates, you know, about half the list is just social insects. The other half is made up of all other land invertebrates. Social insects are very good invasive species. Um, we can think of many uh, such examples, certainly in the southeast. This one, the red imported fire ant, Solenopsis invicta. Um, we know there's now more red imported fire ant in the southeast of the U.S. than there is in their native South America. Uh, there's a yellow jacket here, the common wasp, Vespula vulgaris, which has been introduced to Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, um, other places. There are lots of other um, ants, invasive ants. The Argentine ant is a very sort of nasty invasive pest, which I, is probably somewhere in Atlanta, although not widespread. It's common in California now. And these are, they're not stinging or anything like that, but they just get everywhere. And once they're in an area, they're very hard to get rid of. Something to look forward to later. So social insects are really uh, strong invasive species. And we use uh, molecular genetic markers to try to understand the social biology, the social structure of invasive species and their population biology and ecology. I'm going to spend just a minute trying to introduce you to this sort of a super fast lesson. Um, Molecular genetic markers for us means genetic markers where individuals differ. So for example, we use DNA microsatellite markers. These are pieces of the genome that differ in size at which individuals usually differ from each other. This crazy picture up here actually shows several of these DNA microsatellite markers, actually, let's see, I think three of them, ones that are coded green, another one that's blue, and another one that's coded yellow, for individuals, many individuals, about 30 or so, and every, every time you see two different spots here, two different yellow spots in this particular case, that means that that individual has two different alleles for that yellow uh, locus. And if you have a lot of variation, what you can do is you can basically tell one individual from another, or one individual's offspring from another, or an individual from one population from an individual from another population. And what we do, well, what I'm going to talk about here is we do a lot of paternity analysis in uh, invasive social insects to try to understand their breeding system. This is something that I sort of ripped off from the internet um, about paternity analysis in, in uh, humans, sort of diplo diploid individuals. Very briefly, uh, if you have a mother who has two different alleles shown by these two different blocks that are run on some kind of a gel, she will transmit one of those alleles to her offspring, shown here, an alleged father, you know, Mori Povich stuff here, will transmit one of his alleles to the uh, offspring. And doing this sort of analysis, you can tell in this case that this child could have been produced by this male. Whereas in this case, this alleged father uh, didn't, clearly did not contribute either one of his two alleles to that offspring. Point is, you can sort of tell who's the daddy, okay? We do sorts of similar things with uh, social insects and yellow jackets here in particular. By looking at a bunch of offspring workers here, uh, we can d determine, in this particular case, if we didn't see any of this stuff with the queen and the males, we just looked at the offspring and we knew their genotypes, we could tell in this case of these six wasps, five of them were produced by the quote red male, that just by one male, and one was produced 
by another male. And this can provide us a lot of interesting information about what's going on within colonies. So I want to tell you about a recent study that we did having to do with an invasive species, the longhorn crazy ant, uh, Paratrachina longicornis. So this ant uh, is quite small and its last name, longicornis, means longhorn and you can probably see why. It's got these very long antennae and it is found everywhere. These yellow spots are all the locations where it has been noted. Basically, if you look hard enough in any location, you'll find some instance of this ant. Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, islands, continents, whatever. Um, it, it's not a huge sort of pest in terms of fire ants where they're going to try to eat your children or anything like that. They're usually just found in greenhouses or you know, in, in uh, uh, nurseries, uh, plant nurseries or this kind of thing. But they really are one of the most widespread ants in the world. So much so that we're not even really sure where they originated from at this point. Um, it's thought to be, you know, maybe Africa, Asia, but we just don't know at this point. So when we were at Georgia Tech here, we were interested in studying the invasion biology of this longhorn crazy ant, and we developed these genetic markers. And uh, we started to study the population genetic structure of these ants to try to figure out where were they coming from, how were they moving, etc. And we found this really weird pattern, okay? And the pattern was that for many of the variable genetic markers we looked at, the queens and the males and the workers had completely different allele frequencies. So what this graph shows are the allele frequencies at four different DNA microsatellite loci. And we're, if we just look at this first set of panels for this marker uh, 5.f7, um, there were two alleles with the very exciting names of 160 and 172. And it turned out that all of the queens that were sampled had a 160 homozygous genotype, all of them from this population. All of the males had a 172 genotype. And all of the workers had 50-50 allele frequencies. This made, uh, and if you look across uh, these other loci, these are just four other loci, we saw exactly the same thing. Queens, completely genetically differentiated from males, very different from workers who showed intermediate frequencies. This was extremely weird because, of course, queens and males should mate, produce, produce new queens and males who will have slightly you know, intermediate frequencies. Those will mate in the next generation. So queens and males within a normal sort of ant population should have the same allele frequencies unless something really weird is going on. And so this was one of our first signs that there was something extremely strange happening. These gross differences between the, the sexes and especially this sort of complete heterozygosity of workers. And we worked with a collaborator in Switzerland, uh, Laurent Keller, who brought these ants into the lab and basically had a, a postdoc watch how they reproduce. And not watch, but really, you know, get them to mate. Well, watch too. Get them to mate and look at the offspring and see exactly what was happening. And it turned out that in this ant, both queens and males are reproducing clonally. And workers, however, are produced sexually. I'm, I'm gonna try to relay how incredible and bizarre this system is. Um, this, this sort of shows the genetic system as we currently understand it in this ant. Queens, again, they are diploid. They produce new queens without any contribution from the males. If you can remember from the, uh, the past slide I showed about how reproduction works in these ants, bees, and wasps, usually males and queens get together to produce new queens. In this case, we don't see that. The, queens, the new queens that are produced are genetically identical to their mothers. That has been found. The males are, you can sort of wrap your head around, you know, parthenogenetic reproduction of females. That happens, it's not that common, but it certainly happens, it happens in insects. What is truly bizarre is clonal reproduction of males. And it's very, it's, you know, if you think about it for a second, it's kind of a little, a little scary. So, <laughs> males here, it was found, newly produced males from a, quote, mating between a queen and a male, they were always genetically identical to their fathers. And so the question is, how does, a male clone itself, a male doesn't reproduce. A male mates with a queen. The queen produces new males, but the, those males that that queen produces has none of her genes, okay? So we don't know the mechanism of what's going on here yet. There's a couple of uh, possible things that could be happening. One is that there could be some kind of genome loss. So you have an intermediate heterozygous uh, embryo or egg being produced that loses its female genome. That, that genome loss has been seen in other species, not here. You could have fertilization of unfertilized eggs or something, but we don't know how this is happen, happening. 
And then finally, the workers, um, they're getting, actually being reproduced produced, uh, sexually. So again, very strange. These differences in how the different castes are produced. And so this is sort of an exciting finding. And we're, it's such a strange thing. We're interested in learning more about how the, you know, the system evolved, what the mechanisms are, how the genomes differ. But at this stage, what we, what we can say is, um, this is just a very strange system leading to all kinds of things like the queens and males that are from the same family. Okay, if this male and this queen mate, the new queens and males that are produced are unrelated to each other genetically, even though they're, it, it sort of screws up everything you think about in terms of families. Um, we wonder if this genetic system is some, not somehow associated with the invasion biology of these insects, whether this has been helpful in some way to prevent inbreeding. Although we need to really find what they're doing in their native habitats if we can ever figure out where that is. To jump uh, off this system, which is uh, very exciting, to another very interesting system, um, we are also studying invasive yellow jackets, our favorite species of interest. And these invasive yellow jackets, uh, I alluded to earlier, there are species that have been introduced uh, in various places throughout the world. I talked about one that was introduced to Australia and New Zealand. And these, in, when yellow jackets invade new habitats, especially warm climates, they do very, very cool things. This is a picture I showed earlier of a typical sized yellow jacket nest, good sized yellow jacket nest at the end of the year. Again, several combs stacked together, about the size of a rugby ball or something like that. In some places where yellow jackets have been introduced, in, the war in warm uh, parts of the world, for example, in Australia, New Zealand, California, Hawaii, other places, the growing season for the nest does not end sort of when it gets cold. So here in Atlanta, when it gets to be December, it's cold enough that the nest degrades and dies. In California or Hawaii, that's not the case. And colonies can actually keep growing throughout the winter because it's still plenty warm, there's still plenty of food around, and keep growing for another year or multiple years. When this happens, you can get huge super colonies. And this picture is a, an old picture, obviously, taken of a super colony in New Zealand. Way down here is a researcher wearing a bee uh, outfit. The nest itself, you can make it out here, it extends all the way up this tree, okay? It's about 15 feet high and about five feet across, this one single yellow jacket nest, okay? This is a, a rare yellow super colony, probably a three year, three year old or more, they didn't, certainly didn't know a super colony that had sort of grown around this tree in New Zealand. Now this kind of behavior actually happens to many species of uh, yellow jackets that invade new territories, and even in some of their native territories where it's warm. You may not recall, but a few years ago, we had a very, very mild um, winter, and there were reports of some of these things, not like, not this size, but things that were maybe, you know, five feet long and several feet across that were found in southern Alabama and even southern Georgia and Florida. The southern yellow jacket, Vespa squamosa, will make super colonies if it's in the right place. And so that can have an, even happen here, not, usually not all the way in Atlanta, but farther south it can happen with mild winters. So we are studying invasive yellow jackets in Hawaii. Um, the species of interest is Vespula pensylvanica. And so this is a species that is native to Washington, the state of Washington, to North America, and farther down the, the west coast. It has been introduced to Hawaii, where it's a real pest. It eats a lot of native insects. Um, and very preliminary analyses by Aaron is showing that it seems to change its social structure in native Hawaiian populations, and that many colonies uh, contain multiple queens, even though we, I don't know if we sampled any real, anything that size, but our, our, our collaborator sampled anything that size. Uh, many colonies contain multiple queens, and the queens some, seem to come not always from within the, the sort of natal nest, which is quite interesting. And so this is an area of ongoing research. Uh, just to summarize this part, uh, this little short part of the talk, um, we're studying invasive social insects. They're very successful and widespread, and they do frequently show changes in social system associated with invasiveness. We think that these things could be related and probably are. And just to let you know, we also study other invasive social insects, such as fire ants uh, and termites. Questions? Anything of interest? Loving it? Good. Ah, uh, yes, good. Close your eyes. This is really exciting stuff. 
Okay, so the next little bit I'd like to tell you about is research that we are doing on genome evolution in social insect species. And this is work primarily by Brendan Hunt, uh, who has done a lot of really interesting work on how genes involved with sociality uh, evolve. And we're basically interested in understanding the molecular evolutionary basis of social behavior and specifically of caste differences. So first of all, to tell you uh, what we're thinking about, I want to introduce you a little bit to um, how it is, what, what are these genes that we're talking about when we talk about genes involved in social behaviors in insects or caste differences. Now to tell you a little bit about more how castes develop. This is sort of a developmental pathway for female yellow jackets. It works as well for female, uh, for your tip, female, your other team, typical female ants, uh, bees, and wasps. Um, basically, within a nest, a uh, queen will lay a diploid fertilized egg, and that egg will basically hatch out and develop into a larva that will grow for uh, a few days or a week or something like that. And at that point, when that larva, that little tiny thing is developing within the nest, it can develop into either a queen or a worker. So typically, unlike what I showed you with the longhorn crazy ant, queen worker differences are not genetically determined. Rather, they're determined by uh, changes in gene expression. So queens and workers have the same genes. Queens turn on one set of genes, workers turn on a different set, and that's how they develop differently. And in yellow jackets, we think that happens around the third larval instar, but at some point, a switch happens for some individuals. They start developing into workers, and a different switch gets turned on, if you will, for, another, for the other set that turn into queens, and then after about five or six weeks, you get these individuals that look very, very different. And you can, these switches sort of, they vary by what species you're talking about. Uh, for example, with honeybees, you may be familiar that queens are fed royal jelly and workers are fed basically less of it. And there are compounds that, within the royal jelly, that cause individuals, well, at some level, cause individuals to develop into queens. In other species, it's less clear. In yellow jackets, queens and workers are produced in different size cells and they get fed different amounts. In some species of ants, it might have to do with overwintering. So there's a lot of environmental cues that sort of start the whole caste differentiation process uh, ecologically. But on a molecular level, these players here are expressing different sets of genes. And it is these genes that are differentially expressed that essentially cause differences in the phenotype between queens and workers. And these are the ones that we are interested in. So we were interested in determining how these so-called caste-related genes evolves. How do these genes that are differentially expressed between queens and workers evolve? And we hypothesize that these, for a variety of theoretical reasons, that these genes should evolve relatively rapidly, relative to genes that are not differentially expressed between queens and workers. And so Brendan went out and he tested this in a couple of our favorite social insect species. Um, first, he looked within honeybees. And I'm going to go through sort of this key result from uh, one of his recent papers. This shows the log, a little complicated here, ratio of expression between queens and workers. What does that mean? That means that genes that are more highly expressed in queens than workers, okay, are on this side of the graph and are actually shown by these little triangles, these open triangles. So all of these spots represent a single gene that is more highly expressed in queens than workers. Genes that are more highly expressed in workers than queens are shown by these blue boxes. So this log ratio of expression, uh, again, is telling us the difference in the expression of a particular gene obtained from a microarray data set. And my little white circles or something have disappeared, but basically genes that are not differentially expressed fall on this uh, zero point or along this zero point. And the other axis here is the branch length, which basically means the rate of evolution. So genes that evolve quickly should have a long, a high branch length, should show up up here. Genes that are evolving slowly should show up down here. Now we expected that genes that were differentially expressed between casts should evolve quickly. And frankly, when we first started this, I expected that it shouldn't matter whether they were more highly expressed in workers than queens. What that would mean is we'd expect a signal that would look something like this, okay? That rate of evolution should be fast for either queen-biased or worker-biased genes. That is not what Brendan found. Instead, he found that, yeah, queen, genes that were more highly expressed in queens, they did evolve quickly, but ones that were more highly expressed in workers, they evolved slowly, okay? Not what we thought we would find, not what we thought 
I thought we would find for sure. So this was uh, interesting, and recently we've had another data set that Brendan's been able to analyze in fire ants, our, our favorite uh, social insect. And this is a slightly better data set. And here you see fire ant cast. Here's the worker, here's the male, here's the queen. Um, here's a pupil worker, male and queen, just so you can see them. In this case, Brennan had data on genes differentially expressed between adult queens and workers and pupil queens and workers. And some of the first results are shown here. This shows how fast different classes of genes were evolving, okay? If we looked at genes differentially expressed between adult casts and between pupil casts. And the sort of intensity of the greenness is how, dif much, how differentially expressed these were between the casts. So this sort of is clumping queen and worker bias genes together. And what we're seeing is this very nice signal that genes that are strongly differentially expressed between casts, be they the adult casts or the pupil casts, they evolve quickly. And the less differentially expressed you get, the more slowly they evolve until you get these sorts of genes that are not differentially expressed that evolve the most slowly. So this was very sort of interesting uh, data. And I should point out for those who are interested that this is again, is, rate of, is a measure of rate of evolution per gene, DNDS. Now when Brendan went to break this down again to say, okay, ca these cast genes are all evolving quickly. What about worker genes that are more highly expressed in workers versus those that are more highly expressed in queens? Well, this shows the results and again are very sort of interesting finding. Genes that are more highly expressed in queens than workers are shown by these red bars, okay? These strong red bars. And these ones do evolve very quickly in both pupae and adults. Genes that are more highly expressed in workers than queens, they're evolving slower, not significantly slower though, but slower than those that are more highly expressed in queens. And they're not different from those that are not differentially expressed. So what we're seeing is this sort of weird signal, perhaps weird, that, uh, that queen genes evolve very quickly, worker genes don't necessarily, um, and then the unbiased genes basically evolve the slowest as we predicted. So we got part of it right, but not all of it right. And so to sort of summarize this bit, um, we find, or Brennan has found, that cast bias genes do evolve rapidly but worker and queen bias genes seem to show differences in how they evolve. And we're now starting to think and understand that this has to do with how selection operates on these genes. It could be that, well it is theoretically predicted, that selection will operate differently on queen genes than worker genes because of the way, because workers uh, basically don't reproduce themselves and selection operates less efficiently on workers in certain cases. I want to let you know that we're in terms of sort of molecular evolution and genomics, we've become very interested in epigenetic inheritance as well and uh, starting to do a lot of work on DNA methylation and hopefully other aspects of epigenetic inheritance in social insects uh, for the future. And we think that this, these you know, epigenetics inheritance, which I won't go into here, has important effects on social insect biology. All righty. I'm going to move forward. I'm just going to take a few. I'm not going to get through everything here. I'll take a few more minutes to tell you about a third aspect of our research which has to do with uh, sort of life history strategies and ecology and evolution of social insects. And again, the folks who have been involved shown at the bottom of the page. And we're interested here in understanding how social biology influences the sorts of decisions that colonies make and the competition and cooperation that happens within colonies. So for this little bit, I want to tell you about one, one aspect of this research which has to do with multiple mating of queens. So female multiple mating actually happens a lot in, uh, in animals and all organisms. And it's sort of a, a puzzle because we think that this multiple mating should have a cost. Why do females do it? There must be some kind of uh, a, a payoff for the female or for the offspring themselves. It turns out that multiple mating of females has really, in addition to sorts of general thinking of, of multiple mating, has really weird effects in social insects. Because uh, when a social insect queen mates multiply, she produces a family, a mixed family if you will, of individuals of different relatedness. And this has always 
been a bit puzzling because not only has the queen taken on the cost of mating in general, you know, of multiple mating in general, which is, you know, time and energy, but now she's producing a colony that has sort of, of a mixed family, and that's believed to sort of decrease the benefits to the workers for helping each other if individuals are less related than more related. And this, so this is an area of some interest by many people. Um, it turns out that several social insect queens do mate multiply, some of the most famous ones here. The honeybee queens, uh, they mate with 10 to 20 males. They mate many, 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 many times. Um, there is, this is an ant, a uh, harvester ant, that also mates multiply, and it turns out from previous studies, other species of yellow jackets, queens also mated multiply. So we were interested in understanding this multiple mating. Ah, okay. So just to show you a little uh, short video here, maybe to wrap up, what you see here is uh, a yellow jacket nest that we collected. Typical so little stuff here. The typical yellow jacket nest is surrounded by some foliage. They're exiting, entering and exiting a hole there, a small hole. You can't see much. This is a sort of close-up. You can see little workers flying in and out going foraging. Coming back and forth. Right now we're not bothering them, obviously, otherwise they'd be trying to kill us. And what we do is we pour some ether down that entrance hole to knock them out, and then we go in with our bee suits and we can pull out the nest. And so you can see here is the yellow jacket nest that we pulled out here, put it in a box while they're still sort of knocked out, drugged up, and bring it back to the lab. That's sort of a, that's a smallish nest for that time of year, sort of you know, medium to small. And then if we're, if we're lucky, once we're done pulling this thing out, you can actually see, in this case, a little shaky, this is the queen. We actually found the single queen of the colony. These are some workers. Whoa, whoa, whoa. all right. So the queen is, uh, you can see she's pretty drug drugged up there and she's trying to get out of the light and, you know, typical hangover. But anyways, they all come back to the lab and that's sort of uh, what happens with them. So we went out into the local area. So a few years ago, we collected many of these yellow jacket nests, um, brought them back to the lab, pulled them apart, found the queen if we could, found the workers, and then genetically analyzed them, basically did paternity analysis on them. And what we found is that both species of yellow jackets here, the Vespula maculifrons, the eastern, and squamosa, the uh, southern, they mate, the queens mate many times. So here we have the number of mates versus the number of different queens that we sort of analyzed. They all mate multiply. There's no queens that mated only a single time. Um, squamosa, the southern yellow jacket, in red here, th those queens mate a bit more than the eastern yellow jacket, but they're both around, you know, five to six times per queen. So one of the things that we were interested in looking at was whether there was sort of cheating going on within the nest. And what I mean by cheating here is there's a special kind of cheating that can happen in social insect colonies by males. And that will happen if some males produce a lot of workers, but not a lot of new queens. Remember that both queens and workers, they get contributions from males. They're sexually produced, typically. So for example, let's say we're looking at a yellow jacket nest. For simplicity here, there's a single queen as there is uh, in, for both these species. And let's say she's mated to two males, the quote red and blue male. And when we go in and we find that, in this case, we analyze a whole bunch of workers, and we find that five, six of the workers, for what it's worth, were produced by the red male, and one six were produced by the blue male. We can do this paternity analysis. You can say, okay, the, the red male looks like the winner. He's, for whatever reason, which is of interest, he's sort of obtained more reproductive success. However, you have to remember that workers typically do not reproduce. So this doesn't tell us anything about sort of evolutionary winning and losing, because none of these individuals typically will reproduce. Instead, we have to look at what happens with new queen production. So if we look at the same colony and then look at the production of new queens by these two males, here instead we see the red male has only produced one quarter of the new queens, whereas the blue male has produced three quarters. So what's actually happened here is the red male has, used, has had his sperm used or whatever for worker production, which gives him no sort of fitness advantage, while the blue male has basically, you know, however he's done it, parasitized the red male, he's getting all the reproductive, or most of the reproductive success. And so this kind of switching, you know, could happen, there should be alleles that allow this to happen, although catching it in the act would be pretty surprising. But we went out and we tested to see if this kind of thing was happening. Does the proportional contribution of males differ between, uh, for queens and workers? And just to let you know, uh, we looked at several colonies. The colony numbers are given here, 34, 35, 
And this is the worker and gyne is a, is a way for a non-reproductive queen. To cut to the chase in this sort of uh, slide, each one of these bars shows the proportional contribution of a given male to either new queen production or worker production. And if you look across, what you'll see is although there's some variation for each male in queen versus worker production, there's not a lot of differences. We don't see this cheating going on. Um, and overall, looking at all colonies, these are the p-values to see whether those contributions were different. We do not see the kind of cheating that I talked about. And so whatever is happening, there's no sort of good male allele that's going in there that's getting a lot of queen production, but not a lot of male production. And I think I am running out of time, and I think I'm just going to I'm going to end there. Actually, I'll, I'll let me let me just jump ahead real quick to let you know that we're doing other work uh, with some folks in physics on nest building in social insects. Nest, social insect nests are amazing. Um, term, some termite nests, for example, uh, termites can be smaller than a centimeter, but they can make a nest that can be up to 10 meters high, close to 10 meters high, which is equivalent to you know you to humans building structures a thousand times our size without technology and in the dark. So social insect nests are pretty amazing things. And we're working with Dan Goldman's group uh, in physics to try to understand how this happens. This is some studies in fire ants, and we have some early results about uh, network patterns and properties. This is what a, a typical fire ant does when you leave it in a, in a matrix. It just starts digging and moving things around and making tunnels. That's what they, they like to do when they're not stinging people. Um, and I will just go on to say and wrap up here that Uh, we're continuing to study social insects, and we think they provide insight into biological complexity and to social behavior in general. These are my funding sources, and I uh, thank the people who did the work, actually, and those of you who are here. I'll take any questions. There, there may, most of those genes, that's a good question, so sort of what genes are we looking at and which ones are turned on? There may be genes that are on-off. There probably are, but they may be expressed at very low levels, whether they're transcription factors or other types of things. We may not be detecting them. So what we're detecting here are genes that are in some way probably downstream to some, uh, to some extent of the actual changes. Some of those genes are causal for caste differences. Some of them may be just consequences or other kinds of things and may or may not be involved. And these are mRNA levels? Yes, this is microarray. These are microarray data. So yes. There's also all the possibility downstream of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with, and with gene expression, it's worth noting, I mean, that's, a, of course, a snapshot in time. So we had adult and pupil cat, you know, adult and pupae for uh, whole bodies for the fire ants. We had brain gene expression for the honeybees. We had different sets of data. So you know, we're able to take a snapshot look at differences in gene expression uh, in these two species. Yeah, and there's a lot of other stuff going on, no doubt about that. Anything known about regulatory RNAs, small RNAs? <sighs> Not, uh, you guys think of anything? Yeah. Regulatory small RNAs? Not really. There's some yeah. stuff they're trying to look at. They're always behind the game. But... Social insects are not Drosophila, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I should say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions or comments? When you were talking about uh, the rate of evolution of genes, like how were you able to know what that was? And what's the definition of evolution? So it's basically the number of changes that happened in a particular branch length. Brendan, do you want to comment on sort of how you calculate rate of evolution? I like doing this. Isn't this fun? You can just pick on the people directly. Yeah, sure. I mean, you, uh, it's, it's sort of a, a rate of substitution in a given gene for you know, amino acid changing and non amino acid, amino acid changing substitution. So, first you identify gene orthologs, you align sequences, then you calculate these differences with different substitution probabilities, and, and, uh, and there's very well established methods for doing this. He can do it, I can't. So that's good, yeah. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Have a good day.